Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. I, I want to make it clear, I did say Couture's Julie first. I didn't say Bestie, Bestie Day first, but uh, he definitely did not know what Couture's Julie meant. Um, so, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I have a quick question. I, I kind of missed the uh, earlier poll about how many people were at Rustfest, but it's okay. How many people saw my, the Rustfest Berlin talk I gave? Okay. This is going to be a very different talk today. Just to, so, that, so you should feel better, I guess, cause if, you, if you sat through that one. Okay. Um, so I have a book. This is the Rustfest Carol. It's a story by myself, Felix Clock, otherwise known as Punk, Pink Felix. Of course, I'm making allusion to Charles Dickens. And also, you might see a little David Foster Wallace or Mark D. Uh, Zalus, Danieluski, Mark Z. Danieluski, if you uh, look closely, maybe. And of course, this is a work of fiction. There can't possibly be anything related to anything that's actually going on in the real world here. Okay, so... Our story opens on an IRC conversation where Manish says, re-implement it in Rust, to which Pink Scrooge says, bah, humbug. And why is it? Why does he have this attitude about, about this simple phrase, re-implement in Rust? And he says, well, Rust, this thing, it's just a language where writing types, you don't ever get actually get any code out of it. You sit there, you wait, you become a compile cycle older. You don't have any object file to show for it. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes around saying re it and rust on their lips, they should be nailed up on their own crate and buried with a bicycle gear through their heart, for which he was, he was promptly ejected from the chat room for such, for such talk. And Scrooge's behavior wasn't just you know, constrained to that. He was also kind of mean to his colleagues as well. He yells, Critchit! Cargo is broken! To which Alex said, wait, are you talking to me? I'm Alex Crichton. Um, so why is Scrooge acting this way? Well, the basic problem, as you can see from this IRC snippet, is that his problem is that he's really depressed because he says, why are we implementing feature after feature, forcing people to learn whole new ways to program? They'll just leave the language because we're always changing, and they'll go to something stable, like Java or C++. They never change. Um, as, and as we all know, change is death. And once again, <laughs> just once again kicked by Manish. Okay, so, you know, Alex eventually went home and Scrooge pondered over the error he saw on his screen from the borrow checker. He sees this error message, <laughs> scrolls off the screen, so he has to, you know, get a larger window to get some perspective on it. But lo and behold, <laughs> he sees the ghost of Nico. Ah, oh, it's the ghost of Nico. And Nico says, oh, the chains of stability and backwards compatibility, they are heavy. You must change your way of thinking. Tonight, you, Scrooge, will be visited by three spirits. Nico's not dead. At least he's not in the story. Or well, he's not, definitely not dead in real life, and he's not dead in the story. Or maybe he is. Or maybe he's just overwhelmed. It's just a note. So at this point, you might be wondering, what is going on in this talk? I thought I came to a technical <laughs> conference. Um, and the answer is, well, tonight, you are all going to be visited by three ghosts. And we're going to you know, do it through Scrooge. Scrooge is being visited. There's going to be three ghosts. The ghosts of Epoch's past, Epoch's past, um, which is actually going to be a summary of some of the changes going up to Rust 1.0 back two years ago in May 2015. The ghost of Epoch's presidents, which is going to be talking about the changes. We're going to see the changes from 1.0 up until now. And then we'll be visited by a third ghost. And that will be talking about the changes for future releases. So, the first of the three spirits came upon Scrooge. and said, I am the ghost of Epoch's past. And Scrooge said, long past. He said, no, no, Rust's past. He said, oh, because Rust is so young, it doesn't have a long past. <laughs> and, and what business brought you here, spirit? Rust welfare. So, in case you're not aware, we had the run-up to 1.0 itself. And this actually was marked by a number of intermediate releases. Each one separated by six weeks. We were trying out this six-week six week rapid release cycle. So we had the 1.01 alpha, 
Then six weeks later, we had the 1.0 alpha dot two. And then six weeks later, we had the 1.0 beta. Yeah, so we sort of cheated there and didn't go from alpha to beta. You can you know, talk to the various team members to find out the story there, but we had these releases. And the interesting question is, at least for the purpose of this talk, the interesting question is, what were the big changes that were happening in that time period? Because Scrooge's problem is he doesn't believe change is possible and that you can keep your community together throughout change. So with the 1.0 alpha release, we saw the apocalypse. Indeed, a scary thing. Scrooge says, oh, I remember those days. We once had this int and you went types, and it was a big problem because people didn't know which one to use. They didn't know, not that they didn't know which to use between int and uint. If anything, that might have been the simplest question. But no, was, do I use i32 or do I use int? They didn't realize that int might be target specific or is target specific. So you, you know, program using int and you end up with these uh, portability hazards. And so there were many, many proposals to rename these things, starting, I think, with um, Rust issue 9940. And then there were some RFCs after that. But we resisted change. The core team resisted change. And we almost launched 1.0 using int and uint. And in some ways, it was because of community backlash to this decision on part of the, and the manner in which the core team went through the decision that we learned a lot about community input and about how to interface with the community. In particular, the core team learned it can't just make, it can't decide something based on um, an argument that they made in private and then deliver that as if they were gods coming down from on high. They learned that no, that's not a good way to engage with their community. And in fact, the right way to do it is to still interact with them. If you come up with a new argument, present it. Don't present a decision, present the new argument and then let the community and you figure out, okay, well, where does that leave us? And by the end of all of this, we ended up with I size and U size. Oh, but first we went through a bunch of different potential other options, like I mem, U mem, offset size, in P, U and P, um, but we settled on I size, U size. Okay, six weeks later, whoosh, six weeks later, we have Rust 1.0 Alpha 2. And, the, and for me, the big change that we had added, added in there was the drop check rules. So before that point, we had, we used to not allow you to write a destructor that looked like this. We didn't let you write a destructor that was parameterized over lifetimes or type parameters. At least we didn't let you do it unless you added a little annotation saying basically this might be unsafe or rather this is an unsafe thing because we don't know how to check it. And that was the status quo in Rust for quite a long time, but we managed to figure out something that we thought was sound. Um, for 1.0 alpha 2. So we added the drop check rules, and that, in fact, it changed things. In particular, it, start, it made code start getting rejected. Sometimes it was code that was worth rejecting. It actually had potential problems, but a lot of the time it was code that we just weren't smart enough to check properly. And so, you know, the spirit says to Scrooge, look, you were willing, you were once willing to accept breakage. You were responsible for this. And Scrooge said, I was young. I was a young man then, and... It's all different now. Now, the true history of drop, drop check is probably worth a 45-minute talk on its own. Not going to make you suffer through that. But suffice it to say, there were, it's, it's evolved a lot since then. It's not like we had the right answer at that time. We didn't. We definitely didn't. It wasn't sound the way we did it then. And we fixed a lot. Ariel is here, and he can tell you a lot because he was responsible for a number of the fixes that we had to drop check. Then we have 1.0 beta, six weeks later, whoosh. There, catch panic was introduced. And um, this was an interesting thing because it wasn't possibly for this point to recover from the panic on the same thread that issued the panic. You had to have some sort of monitor thread to be the one to, rec to catch the panic or, or monitor the panic and say, oh, this, th this thread died and somehow report to the user that it died. Um, so we, we landed catch panic. And then there was a lot of uh, controversy over the manner in which catch panic was added and about the details about what catch panic means and what it means for Rust and what to name it, et cetera. There were lots of RFCs. And in fact, we only stabilized it in the 1.9 release under a different name and with some other rules. So we're talking about mm, a year before this thing was actually stabilized. So this represents how change in a way that's usable, because it can sometimes also take time to finally evolve to reach the final thing. And then for 1.0, the, the change that I noticed there, 
we made mem forget a safe function. Up until that point, we had this attitude of forgetting to run your destructors. That sounds scary, and therefore we're going to make this unsafe. You have to know what you're going to assert. You know what you're doing to do that to run, run such a function. The problem with that reasoning was that you didn't need to call mem forget to avoid running destructor. We had, there's a there is a little trick you can do involving um, involving basically reference counted cycles, where you can put an object and forget it in entirely safe code, even without mem forget. So that line of argument was basically to say, look, what's the point of making this unsafe? What's the meaning behind it if I can already get the same effect via safe code? And so we shifted our way of thinking about what unsafe meant. And that was another change. So the spirit said to Scrooge, you see, Rust can change. Your thinking can change. And Scrooge says, no, no, no. That was before 1.0. That was in that mad time when we were all rushing to make the 1.0 release. This means nothing for now. So we are now visited by the second of three, the three spirits. The, epochs, the, the ghost of Epoch's present. And now Scrooge is sort of like saying, okay, I've had some thinking about this whole you know, change thing, and I'm not so big on this being visited by spirits, so all right, tell me what you have to say. Maybe, maybe you have a point. Teach me. So this spirit is all about what's happened in Rust since 1.0. And in particular, I wanted for this part of the talk to give you a view that wasn't based on my experience. You may have noticed the ghost of Epoch's past that was sort of uh, biased towards things I really knew about deeply, like drop check. For this, though, I decided I have to ask other people. I have to get the input of other people, you know, because we're going to be like that spirit in the cr Christmas Carol who visited the other families that knew Scrooge and what their lives were like at that time. So I did a poll and I asked, um, what are the changes that mattered to you since 1.0? It's a very small poll. Um, and there were some people that said what mattered to me the most was the IDE support we ad we've added, um, the t rust up tool, and a lot of people said our, be our improved error diagnostics was a huge, huge win. Um, how many people are familiar with the change to the error diagnostics that have happened since 1.0? Okay, um, now of you, how many of you think it was a, you know, it made things worse in your life? If you, uh, okay, yeah, no hands. Yeah, everyone agrees. <laughs> everyone agrees. This was so much better. There are some features that have been added since 1.0 that are only available in the uh, nightly channel of Rust. You can't use them in stable Rust. For example, there's this never type feature where if you uh, match on something, and if you match on something in one of the variants, it can be proven via the type system to actually never have an instance, a so-called uh, empty type, or you know, like an, uh, an enum with no variants in it is an example of a void type. And the never type feature lets you do things where you say, look, if I have a result where the okay type is T and the error type is void, where it cannot, it cannot be instantiated, you can actually write a match arm that doesn't include the error case because it's impossible that it could ever occur. There are some features that are only available in the Rust beta channel. Um, we have RC of unsized types, but in the beta channel in particular, we have RC of stir, which is kind of interesting. And there are some features, most people point out features that are available in stable Rust. So the most important features in terms of the number of people who responded about them are things that actually have made it to stable. Like that was by far the longest list of things that I saw, which things that are, in the, are available for, the, for stable use. Things like if let, um, the question mark syntax that's been the replacement for try. Who remembers try bang, try exclamation point? Now, who still uses try exclamation point? Okay, a lot of people put your hands down, but I, you know, I respect the people that still have their hands up. I am one of you. I still use try bang because I have my fingers haven't quite. I don't have the muscle memory in my fingers yet. Things like pub crate for being able to expose um, visibility just to your crate and not to the outside world. Things like infiltrate. But by far, by far, the thing that the most people responded saying, this is the change that mattered, was macros 1.1. The ability to have stable, der customized derive, and in particular, its use in CERD. So this part of the talk, um, I decided there were so many people who responded that way, I have to show you some code. I'm obligated to actually work through an example. So. Here's a hypothetical trait called weight. This has nothing so far to do with custom derive, not exactly. The weight trait is meant to be something that all it does is counts the number of heap allocations that are owned by this type. This is not something that exists in Rust today. We're going to try to implement it ourselves in a very stupid way. Um, not stupid like inefficient, just stupid like it's not going to be um, able to handle certain cases that one might care about. So 
By default, most values aren't heap allocated, as in they're in allocated in line in someone else's thing. It might exist on the heap, but it itself doesn't own anything that's heap allocated. For example, an integer doesn't own anything that's heap allocated. Um, whether it's I32 or I64, both those things have a weight of zero. And likewise, a reference has weight zero, because even though it might point to something on the heap, it doesn't own anything that's on the heap. It's just a reference to something that somebody else owns. So all of these cases of integers and of references are all things that should return zero for their weights. The first interesting case are things like string and box. A string is heap allocated. So since it's some heap allocated object, we're going to have, it has a weight of one. That's very simple. It's just a single heap allocated um, character buffer array. A box is more interesting. It has a heap allocation, but it also have, owns contents that may have other heap allocations. So the way you implement weight for box is you've, you have the heap allocation for the box itself, that's the one, and you have to recursively ask, how much do my contents weigh, and add them together. And you can test this. I have a this is all running code, by the way. I, the way I write my talks, in case you're not familiar, is I use this tool called Tango to like, make Rust code that is also a markdown file, and then I can run all my code. So here we have um, this construct that's a box of a box of a box, and then the string high, and this has a weight of three, because there's three boxes in it. So here's another demo of this weight function. So I, could have a, I might have a struct called French Toast. Its weight will be zero, because it no, it's just an empty struct. So what if I had a struct called Pancakes that had two fields in it? Um, what's the weight of that? You just yell it out if you know. Zero. Yeah. P1 dot weight is zero because it has no boxes inside of it. OK? How about this thing here? This, this P3, it's uh, pancakes with butter and berries and syrup. So three things, does that mean it's got a weight of three? What's the weight of uh, P3 here? Two. That's right, two. Just count the boxes. Very simple. OK, great. Except I just lied to you because this code doesn't actually run. Because why? Any, any takers for why this code won't actually do anything yet? That's right. Weight's a trait, and I haven't implemented it yet. You have to actually implement the trait for every type that you want to use it on. So that also means, for example, that running weight on an option of box won't work. You really want it to. You want to be able to do things like ask what the weight of, a bo of some box of one is and get back one, and what the weight of none is and get back zero. You want to do that and have it just be just count the boxes. But we don't have that yet. We haven't implemented the trait. So OK, let's start implementing the trait. Oh, yeah, for this, you, uh, for, a, for an option, you, you match, you have the sum case, you recur. For the none case, you have zero. OK. Oh, and uh, we have to do it for result, too, I guess. So we match, you have the OK case, you recur, error case, recur. Ugh. So the problem here is that this is ridiculous. Those implementations, they're mechanically derivable. You can really, you don't have to think to make them. In fact, you might say to yourself, why don't we make a program to make these for us? And in fact, you can do that. Through the magic of procedural macros, you can write a macro that takes in a type definition like this, enum of option, with the sum case and the none case, and it'll generate this code. It'll expand to this code down here, which is basically the same thing as what I just showed you. It modulos some small details in terms of you know, why it has um, certain kinds of patterns being in there and certain kinds of additions, but it's basically the same thing. Okay. So this is less readable, but you know, the point is it's a macro and this is a lot easier to write down and get right than all that code I showed you in the previous slide. Now you might ask, what does the macro implementation look like? How hard is that? It's this. <laughs> I'm a schemer, so I was a little horrified by this, this page. Like, I'm used to macros that are, you know, pretty compact. But in reality, this is actually pretty tight code. It's like 100 lines of code to do something that's pretty complex, because it has to actually, you know, destructure the input and do handle the type parameters of the struct declaration, and whether it's a struct or an enum. There's, there's interesting stuff in here, but I'm not going to show it to you. Um, here's the sad news. Procedural macros are not yet available in the Rust stable channel. You can't actually use this in stable Rust. You have to use nightly. But there's one special case. The special case is derive. Derive is available in stable, and it uses the same technology. And the same, as in, I was able to use that same um, crate that had that macro definition and reuse basically the same functionality to make the derive, so that now, 
when I make French toast, I can say derive wait, and it'll create this implementation automatically where it just says it's zero. It says it in a long-winded way. It matches stupidly and then produces zero. But, you know, we're trusting the compiler will optimize all that away. And likewise, for pancakes, it'll do the right thing there. It'll expand into something that matches in the pancakes, binds the two parts, and then recursively calls um, wait on the two parts. So the lesson here, if there is a lesson, is that of these cases, derive is actually the most important one to support. So that's why it was so important that it become part of stable Rust. Because the reason why it's important is because while it is painful as a crate author, for, if I'm the crate author of the wait trait, yeah, it's painful for me to go and write the implementations for option and result and stuff, but at least I can do that. At least as the author of the wait trait and the wait crate, I have the option of going through the standard library and adding implementations for all the types in the standard library. I can't, as the author of the wait crate, do that for all of my clients. I can't write all their implementations. So the reason why derive is so important is because derive is what gives me the ability, as the wait crate author, a zero effort way for my clients to use my trait. That's the crucial thing about it. And a particular, a particular instance of this is SERD. So SERD is this serialization deserialization library. And the crucial thing is that it's available in stable Rust. And it uses this derive mechanism to provide automatic serialization and deserialization for a whole host of formats, including JSON and Pickle and lots of others. And the crucial thing is that it does this automatically. It's very easy as a user to get these automatic impl implementations. And the code it creates is super efficient in that it's not using reflection or runtime type introspection the way that other languages might to accomplish this. Instead, all the code is generated compile time and specialized to the type. Okay, and there's other crates too that use derive. Um, Diesel is another one, another example of note. So the insight, if there's any insights to be taken from all this, is that a really relatively small language edition, procedural macros, it's not that small, but derive, it's like this sort of niche use case you don't expect, we don't expect many people to implement a macro, but we do expect a ton to use derive. And so these small changes to the language in terms of, you know, how many people expect to use them can have huge changes in your library and in your language ecosystem of your community. Okay, so Scrooge has been pretty convinced at this point that change is possible, maybe, but he still has the last of the spirits that is going to visit him. And the ghost of Epoch's yet to come enters the IRC channel, but he says nothing. And then he points. And he points again. Oh, spirit, what is this you're showing me? Oh, spirit. Oh, spirit, why? Why is what is what could this be? And he points again. Oh. Spirit, no, no, I can change, I can change spirit, and Russ can change too. Okay, I personally am not actually concerned about Russ dying. This is all just, you know, narrative, etc. And why am I not concerned? It's because we have an awesome community of people that are super enthused to work on it, and we have our friends, the actual companies like our sponsors that are using Rust in practice and are going to keep it alive, regardless of what happens um, in the future. So I want to make that clear. So end of the story. Scrooge has come to accept change. And he's a fundamentally different person than he was perhaps before this visit. You might call him a Scrooge for 2018. And Aaron Turon enters the room, the IRC channel, and says, what, what has Scrooge been going off about? We aren't going to do any breaking changes anyway. So what Aaron's talking about is this. We already have a number of things that enable change within Rust. We have the nightly stable split. We have a rapid release cycle, and we have support for deprecation. So we can evolve Rust over time. This, we've known this. this. That's why this second spear was able to show us changes that have happened since 1.0. But, but, 
the, thing, the, the mechanisms we have in place are insufficient. They, because, in particular, they don't allow us to make certain changes. And also, the mechanisms that we have in place, Rust kind of evolves in this weird way where, you know, a change comes at a sort of random time, and another one comes at a random time, and the docs aren't necessarily, like, updated to, you know, incorporate these new idioms. And there aren't blog posts announcing, oh, look, all these awesome new things that are available. You see a blog post here, a blog post here about one particular change or another. If you don't see, you know, a really enthusiastic, here's why you should look at Rust now instead of before. And we want to change that. So the Epoch system is, has, has been accepted as RFC 2052. And the idea of the Epoch system is that we're going to declare an Epoch every two or three years. And it's going to, each ep Epoch is going to, I've heard this pronounced a number of different ways. I've learned that some people pronounce it epic. Um, okay, okay, there's some of you raising your hands for that. I always thought it was like, I always thought it was Epoch or Epoch. Epoch is what I always well, almost always say, but now because of Unix, I say epoch. Um, anyway, each epoch provides a set of features that have been stabilized since the last epoch, and the crucial thing is that we want everything to sort of move in tandem. All the tooling, the docs, um, and our standard library should be updated to make use of the new features. And the way it works is that you have to a crate has to opt into the given epoch by saying up front, here is the epoch that I expect to, be, to be, expect to work with the features that I want to use. And if you don't say it, then you assume you're in the 2015 epoch. And the other crucial pieces of this puzzle are that, one, the Rust compiler is going to support all the epochs going back to the original one in 2015. Two, we're going to support linking crates that come from different epochs. So you can take a crate that has not been updated since 2015, and have it interoperate with your crate from 2018, and then your crate that incorporates the one from 2015 and your crate from 2018 will be able to work with somebody else's crate from 2024, and they should all work together. We ought to be able to link code together and preserve the semantics of the code that was old. And finally, in terms of evolution, an epoch can only introduce a hard error if we actually warned you about it. We, if, we can only issue, introduce a hard error for a certain form if the previous epoch was telling you via a deprecation warning, hey, hey, this is going to break. So this adds up to an assertion that the epochs do not split our ecosystem, nor do they break existing code. That is the claim that we are making. So we get to consider new changes. Changes like the catch construct, to go with the question mark. Changes like changing our module hierarchy system to be inferred instead of be explicit. These are things we're considering, nothing set in stone. Dine trait, instead of saying, tra instead of saying bear trait. Um, so you might say ampersand dine trait instead of ampersand trait. And changes to our visibility system. We might change things so that it's a, you say crate FN instead of saying pub crate FN. We'll see. The crucial thing to take away from these bullets is that, for the most part, the epoch system will enable syntactic changes. Those are the things we're mostly be focusing on. Changes to the, like, you know, the way things look. Now, syntax changes can enable semantic changes, but keep in mind, because you have to link old code and new code, you're, I don't expect to see massive revisions to semantics, because in the end, we have to be able to link things together in a sane way. So, none of these changes, though, that I'm talking about can happen without our community, and so it's very important that everyone, you know, get involved and, and, and hack on Rust, use Rust, but also give back and, and work on, help contribute to the standard library and contribute new crates to the ecosystem. And in particular, I want to advertise the impl period that's going on for the remainder of 2017. We're encouraging everyone at every level of knowledge to contribute to Rust itself, to making Rust better during the impl period by getting mentorship. Um, so you can read the blog post, the impl future for Rust blog post on the Rust blog that talks about this. Basically, there's something, there is something for you. If you want to come help, there is something for you, and we will help you find it. So, uh, final message on change. So, don't be like the Scrooge whose epoch was 2015. Be like the Scrooge from 2018, because, yes, change is hard, but it can be hard fun. Let's go out and get impling. All right. Thank you. <laughs>